Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Gabe Gutierrez in Washington. As public and private calls for President Biden to step aside after last week's debate performance are gaining momentum. With brutal new polling out this afternoon, as the president and his White House allies feverishly work to salvage his candidacy and the remainder of his presidency. In just a few hours, President Biden is set to meet at the White House with Democratic governors. And it comes as sources tell me that the Biden campaign is now reaching out to conservative Democrats as part of an urgent effort to prevent defections within the party from snowballing. The president is also personally working the phones with a flurry of conversations with top Democrats, including Chuck Schumer, Hakeem Jeffries, Nancy Pelosi, Jim Clyburn and Chris Coons. And both Biden and Harris spoke directly to campaign staff this afternoon with the president telling his team, I'm not leaving and no one is pushing me out. The full court press by Biden officials comes as more Democrats are publicly voicing their frustrations. While Texas Congressman Lloyd Doggett became the first Democratic lawmaker on Capitol Hill to call on Biden to withdraw, telling my colleague Hallie Jackson last night that voters in his district say the president needs to step aside. I would say that uh, the input from my constituents has been 10 to 1 in favor of replacing uh, President Biden on the wow. ticket. And then with the, the Supreme Court decision on Monday, uh, we know that, that if a criminal and his gang take over the White House, there will be no checks and balances from the, uh, the courts. The White House has pushed back forcefully on calls for the president to step aside or suggestions that he won't run even amid recognition that he must overcome Thursday's bad debate to be successful. Here's White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre. Is President Biden considering stepping down? Absolutely, absolutely not. And you heard, I, think, I believe, directly from the campaign as well. It was not his best night. He understands that it is fair for people to ask that question. But we cannot forget his record and what he's been able to do. We cannot forget how he has been able to deliver for the American people for almost four years. That matters too. Meanwhile, more signs of trouble in the polls. A post-debate New York Times Siena poll has President Biden's support eroding. With former President Trump holding a nine-point lead among registered voters. It's the first post-debate poll to show a gap outside the margin of error. That number tightens slightly to six points among likely voters, pushing it back within the margin of error, but just barely. And yet another poll out this afternoon from the Wall Street Journal shows a six-point gap between Trump and Biden among registered voters, the widest lead for Trump in that poll since 2021. We should note, two other surveys released this week show a much smaller margin, with Mr. Biden tied or slightly trailing Mr. Trump within the margin of error. And joining me now is Monica Alba at the White House. Saho Kapoor is on Capitol Hill and also with me, Peter Baker, Chief White House Correspondent at the New York Times and an NBC News political analyst. Thank you all so much for joining us. And Monica, I do want to start with you. The president will meet with governors in just over two hours. What are we expecting from this meeting and what are these Democratic governors looking to hear? I think it's notable, Gabe, that several of these governors are coming to attend this meeting in person, and that's because it seems they want to hear directly from the president. They want to have this exchange so that they can assess for themselves what the president is saying in public now and in private to his own campaign staff about his poor debate performance. And so I think they want to be able to have that opportunity to ask some questions and to participate in this. And many of those governors expressed some concern in the initial days after the debate that they hadn't heard from the president. So this is also just an opportunity for them to be able to have that conversation and then also be able to go back to their states and to their constituents and try to maybe relay some of whatever the message may be from the president or from the vice president, which we got a clear window into earlier today from both the campaign call and then the call with the White House chief of staff. But I think, Gabe, there's really a recognition here that some of the president's own key allies privately have been saying that they have concerns about what they saw on the debate stage and that they really need to know that some of that can be addressed before they can make a larger comment or statement about what they think the president should do in the race. And we saw that similarly from some top congressional leadership as well. But the White House knows that the governors are really important since they include, of course, some people who could be running for the Democratic ticket in the future. And that's a really big part of the backdrop to all of this as well. 
Yeah, certainly. Uh, you know, Monica, the president was pretty emphatic in his earlier campaign call. What do we know about how that was received among staff? And look, I think it tells you a lot, Gabe, that they decided that it was important enough for the president and the vice president to join this call. They hadn't really communicated in that way with campaign staffers since the disastrous debate performance. So I think the fact that they did get on this and tried to really say in the plainest of terms, the president said, essentially, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not leaving. No one is pushing me out. I am going to be committed to this. I'm going to be the nominee. And he said, I'm in this race to the end and we're going to win. That is what he wanted to communicate. And the vice president, for her part, said, look, you guys know Joe Biden, and he has fought for you and for Americans for decades. And she essentially argued it's our turn, in her words, mm -hmm. to now fight for him. So this unity image is something they really wanted to present today, because also the president and the vice president had lunch today at the White House, which is something they sometimes do. But notable that it happened today and that she's going to be with him tomorrow for the 4th of of July celebration as well. So they're trying to really project this image of unity when behind the scenes we know there are a lot of really difficult and intense questions being raised, Gabe. Yeah, Monica, the president is now telling supporters that his bad debate performance was because of jet lag. He said that in a fundraiser last night, but he did have, you know, more than 10 days, about 12 days to rest up before the debate once he got back to the U.S. How is the White House explaining that? I know the press secretary, Karine Jean-Pierre, was asked about that this afternoon. Yeah, repeatedly, because when the president raised that last night, it was notable that he did so without teleprompters. So clearly that's something that he wanted to share from his own viewpoint, or maybe that's something he really believes, and that is why he told donors that. But when you do look at the calendar, he was able to return from Italy to Los Angeles, where he participated in a mega fundraiser with George Clooney and former President Obama. But then he was able to really dedicate the next 11 or 12 days or so to debate prep if he wanted to. There were other issues and there were other events that he dealt with. And of course, during the course of his day job as president, he had to deal with some of that incoming as well, the White House notes. But over and over again today, the press secretary tried to argue that there was jet lag from the overseas travel combined with a cold that came from it that really impacted his performance. But it does strain credulity, no doubt, Gabe, that that could really be something that could take so long. But those were the president's own words. And he said that he nearly joked that he almost fell asleep on the debate stage as a result of that jet lag and that cold. My colleague, Monica Alba, thank you so much for your reporting today. Monica, thanks so much. And Saha, I want to turn to you. We know the president has now spoken to some top Democrats. What do we know about those conversations? Yeah, that's right, Gabe. So here's what we do know. Just today, some five to six days after that shocking debate performance, President Biden has finally made contact with congressional leaders and has spoken to them uh, today. And we know some names of the people he's spoken to. That includes Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. It includes uh, House Democratic Leader Hakeem Jeffries, former Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who's still very influential in the Democratic Party, and Congressman Jim Clyburn, a crucial figure in uh, President Biden's ascent in that Democratic nomination in 2020. Now, our sources and subjects did not reveal the details of those conversations, but we can kind of gather a hint from how the campaign has been uh, you know, conveying to supporters what, what their position is in, you know, uh, calls with surrogates and talking points, including one memo that you obtained today. What they've been saying essentially is uh, pointing to polls that don't show a huge change in the race. Um, of course, some polls do show a bigger change, statistically significant, like Wall Street Journal today, and other polls don't. They're focusing on ones that don't. They're also arguing that if polls do show some slippage in the foreseeable future, that would just be a moment in time. So there's a bit of a heads I win, tails you lose. Uh, you know, argument that they're making with uh, regard to the polls. They're also talking about how their fundraising has been pretty spectacular, both on debate day that they've outraised Trump in the month of June, and they insist that Biden is not going anywhere because if he does, it would be pure chaos. And it would, uh, in one email that uh, the Biden deputy campaign manager sent out to supporters, it would be, quote, the best way for Donald Trump to lose. So, bottom line, they're insisting that Biden's staying in, that he's not going anywhere. And for the first time since that debate, Joe Biden, the famous schmoozer, is finally calling these key allies that he needs to keep on board. Uh, you know, Sahil, I, I want to talk to you about, first, you mentioned five or six days it took him to make some of these calls, including to Clyburn today. I'll, I'll get for your reaction on that. But we're just uh, 
learning some breaking news here that the New York Times is reporting just within the past few moments that Congressman Raul Grijalva has become now the second member of Congress to ask for President Biden to step out of it, a step um, or to leave this race. You know, are the floodgates opening here? Well, that certainly sounds significant, Gabe, uh, given that he's following Lloyd Doggett. Uh, Grijalva represents a blue district in uh, Arizona. He would be uh, he would be the second person, both of them now in blue districts, calling for Joe Biden to step aside. Grijalva is a former chair uh, of the, at least a co-leader, I'd have to go back and look exactly what his title was, of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. So that is significant, but that by itself is not necessarily something that would cause the floodgates to open. I can think of several scenarios uh, that would, uh, you know, put serious pressure on President Biden to consider stepping aside. That is one of the four uh, congr top congressional leaders that I, that I just mentioned to you. He spoke to if any of them were to call on him to step aside, that would be a big problem for him. If uh, a, a series of frontline Democrats who are in competitive districts start to worry that Joe Biden at the top of the ticket is going to cost them their races and cost Democrats their shot at the House of Representatives, that would be a big problem because Democrats at the very least see the House as their best shot to flip, their best shot at a firewall against a hypothetical uh, Donald Trump presidency. And of course, Joe Biden is a Senate guy. He spent three and a half decades in that chamber. If a group of Democratic senators come out and say, it's time for you to go, that would put a lot of pressure on, on Biden. I don't know that Grijalva coming out is necessarily a game changer, but uh, it's certainly something to watch because the numbers are getting worse for him, not better. Sahil Kapoor, live for us on Capitol Hill. Sahil, thank you. I want to turn now to Peter Baker. And Peter, the other part of these discussions about the debate and Biden's fitness is how transparent the White House is being about his health. Now, you've reported that people who spend time with him say his lapses are becoming more common. So if the White House doesn't tackle this head on, are more of these lapses going to surface? Yeah, I mean, I think this is one of the reasons why Democrats are upset. There are a few reasons. One, the debate itself. But two, the sense that the White House may not have been completely forthcoming about the president's age and the condition he has been in. The idea that this would happen on last Thursday night and it would be a first time aberration seems implausible to a lot of people, especially those who have seen him up close in recent weeks and months. Now, is that because of the jet lag? Is that because he was fatigued? That obviously could be a factor. Uh, certainly he thinks it is. So he's saying it is. Uh, but that's, you know, uh, it, it's, it's a problem for the White House because there is this sense that we don't have the full picture of where he is right now. And, of course, we don't know where he's going to be, not just at the end of this year, but at the end of mm -hmm. 2028, if he stays in for another four years. And, Peter, I want to play some of what Congresswoman, uh, former House Speaker Pelosi and Congressman Clyburn told my colleague Andrea Mitchell yesterday. Let's listen. Again, I can't, I'm not a doctor. I can't say what happens three, four years down the road. But I think that in my experience, which is what you asked me, I think that uh, he will continue to be a great well, president of the United States. Uh, I'll have to wait on the experts there in, the, in medicine uh, to give their opinion, uh, because I'm not a doctor, so I have no idea uh, the extent to which all of this may have occurred. Uh, but when you are uh, 81 years old, uh, you are not uh, as nimble uh, as you are at 21. And Peter, as someone that watches this so closely, what was your reaction when you heard that? The fact they didn't just dismiss it out of hand, was it a real shift from a couple days ago, even over the weekend? Does it reflect a real concern or perhaps an acknowledgement that this dismiss, dismiss, dismiss strategy just isn't working? Yeah, I do think it does reflect a shift. I think you're right about that. They're, they can't get away with completely dismissing it without aggravating some of their own Democrats. I mean, that's gone over badly. The, the, the attacks on what they call the bedwetting brigade, these are fellow Democrats who have expressed concern, has only, you know, aggravated a lot of the people who otherwise are supportive of them and not really necessarily helped rally the party behind the president. So you're hearing from Pelosi and Clyburn and some of the others, you know, support but it's measured, and I think people recognize that. They're listening to their constituents, and their constituents, by the way, include their fellow elected office holders. It's not just these two now who have come out and say that they think the president should step aside. There are others who are waiting in the wings who may, in fact, get there themselves for the reasons Sahil talked about earlier, because they're worried about the down-ballot implications. And I think the reason it's been hard for Pelosi and Clyburn and a lot of these Democrats is because they actually do really care and respect and admire Joe Biden, and they don't want to kick him when he's down, but they see out there the threat of Donald Trump coming back, and everybody in the Democratic Party right now considers that to be their number one priority. So, Peter, last night at this off-camera fundraiser uh, that Monica mentioned, the president 
blamed his recent travel for the poor debate performance. He said he, you know, traveled shortly before the debate, even though it was more than 10 days before the debate. But he also joked that he almost fell asleep on stage. But if you remember, and I'm sure you do, the White House had been touting those same trips as proof of his youth and his vigor. You know, what sense does that make? Is this just messy me messaging? Yeah, they've been using his travel schedule as a way to prove that he's not 81. And instead, of course, it's now turned out that it proved that he is 81, right? And in fact, that rather than accommodate, make reasonable accommodations for a man depending on his age, as other uh, politicians have done, you know, Ronald Reagan, obviously, they made accommodations for when he was uh, growing older himself uh, in order to make sure he was at his peak. They seemed intent on showing that Biden could do everything that a 41 year old could. And it's true, obviously, a lot of his own aides who were younger than he was and is uh, were quite exhausted by that travel schedule. But you're right, obviously, they gave him two days off when he got back to go to Delaware to kind of recover. And when they did the debate prep at Camp David, they did, they started each day at 11 a.m. They made sure to carve out time in the afternoon for a nap. Those all may be perfectly reasonable, but it does make you wonder if, if that 23 days leading up to the debate where he had this travel schedule and then the debate prep was responsible for the way he was or an accelerant of what was already happening. Peter Baker, Chief White House Correspondent for The New York Times. Peter, thank you. And let me now bring in Ben Wickler in the critical state of Wisconsin. He's the chairman of the Democratic Party there. Thank you so much for joining us, Ben. And Wisconsin is a critical battleground. The president is heading there on Friday. I want to get your reaction to the president's debate performance last week. How concerned are you? The debate was really tough. It was a really tough debate to watch. Uh, I got lots of phone calls and texts during the debate, after the debate. And then we saw him in North Carolina the next day, and it was the President Biden who gave the State of the Union address. We knocked on 31,000 doors over the weekend. We had more than 1,500 volunteers in motion in the state of Wisconsin, the tipping point state in both of the last two presidential elections. And when they went out and talked to voters, for undecided voters in this election, a lot of them already were aware of the president's age. Uh, a lot of them had not thought a lot about President Trump. And so they were pretty alarmed by what they saw from Trump. That's what we heard from voters on the ground here over the weekend. I think the key thing right now is that voters are going to see President Biden. They're going to see him come to Wisconsin this Friday. They're going to see him in Pennsylvania and in New Hampshire. They're going to see him in televised uh, press interviews. President Biden is going to remind people exactly why they supported him in the primary and through these last four years. And he's going to remind them of the danger if Donald Trump gets back into office, which is uh, really in plain sight planning a military dictatorship in this country. Uh, I think that is going to remind us all why the stakes are so high and why it's time to get focused on winning this election. Ben, you mentioned that voters saw President Biden the day after the debate in North Carolina at that rally. It was very well received. I was there. However, he was also reading from a teleprompter, and he has been reading from a teleprompter in many of his events. Does he need to stop doing that? Does he need to get out there more? President Biden does a mix of uh, conversations. He does photo lines, talks to people one-to-one -one over and over. He does small fundraising events. He does big events. He does the uh, the, the big rallies with the teleprompter. Uh, this is a president who shows up in all kinds of different situations. And the through line is his fundamental decency and patriotism and honesty and conviction and love of his country. The through line is what we heard from the president in response to that Supreme Court ruling that said that a president has criminal immunity for any official act. We know that Trump wants to use that to exact revenge on his enemies. And we know President Biden would never do that and wants to defend the, the fundamental uh, decency of this country. And those are the stakes in this election. I, I know that it's easy to uh, get lost down a million rabbit holes in a moment like this. I also know that President Biden will always fight to, to expand freedom in this country, defend our democracy, and deliver for working people. And the same guy that walked the picket line and went to the war zone in Ukraine is the same president who's running for re-election right now. And that's why Democrats are organizing in battleground states to make sure that he wins this race. Do you think President Biden is the only Democrat that can beat former President Trump? Trump this November? President Trump is a terrible, terrible candidate. He was a terrible president. And Democrats should not underestimate the the uh, the, the dark energies that he brings out in American politics. It's a frightening thing to watch. And right now he's uh, posting on Truth Social that he wants military tribunals for his critics. So I think we need to throw everything we can at this. And we know that President Biden can beat Donald Trump because he did it before. Last time, it was during the COVID pandemic and the Republicans kept organizing on the ground all the way through while Democrats were just virtual. It was a close election, we won. This time we're organizing with everything we've got 
got. We've got 48 offices in Wisconsin, and, and President Biden is visiting Wisconsin over and over again in a way that was impossible during the 2020 year. So I think he has every opportunity to, to beat Donald Trump if we all put in the work. And the, the number one focus that I have is to ensure that we bring about that outcome and save American democracy in this moment of crisis. Ben, the Times Siena poll taken after the debate that we were referencing earlier in the program had 74 percent of respondents saying that the president is just too old to serve. Now, that debate had a big audience. So is it possible to change these people's minds with just roughly four months left in this race? This was the earliest presidential debate in political history, I think, as long as, as I'm aware of, certainly in modern televised debate history. We have a long way to go. And what people want to see and will see from President Biden is the the energy and, and vigor and focus that we saw in North Carolina, that we saw at the State of the Union address, and that I'm sure we'll see in Wisconsin this Friday. Uh, that helps remind people that President Biden has been knocking it out of the park when he's been counted out over and over again. Mm -hmm. And it will help draw folks' attention to the contrast between the kind of future that we'll experience in a Biden second term versus a Trump second term when the gloves are off and his uh, administration is by people who are sworn loyalty to Donald Trump instead of to our Constitution. Ben, ben uh, before I let you go, um, we did hear from uh, Senator Tammy um, Baldwin's campaign, and we've learned that she will not appear with uh, President Biden on Friday when he visits. Now, she had a prearranged schedule, and, you know, the Biden campaign says that she'll be, a, you know, 100 miles away. But should she have made it a point uh, to show up at that event with President Biden, perhaps uh, have a show uh, of unity? Senator, uh, Senator Baldwin is campaigning all over Wisconsin. In Madison, Governor Evers and, and myself and, and other officials are going to be there with the president. Uh, I want us to cover the ground across our state, uh, something we're doing weekend after weekend. This last weekend, we had Wes Moore and Jim Clyburn in two different cities at the same time. Uh, we want to make sure voters everywhere are hearing from Democrats and the contrast between a vision of freedom and democracy and delivering for the middle class and mega extremism, abortion bans, and attempts to dismantle American democracy. Democracy. Ben Wickler, chairman of the Democratic Party in Wisconsin, that critical battleground. Ben, thank you so much. And Thanks coming so up, much. the devastating wreckage left in Hurricane Barrel's wake as the historically powerful early season storm churns through the Caribbean. We're live in Jamaica with the latest on the damage there and where the storm is headed next. But first, can President Biden's campaign weather the political storm? Our panel is here to break it down. You're watching Meet the Press Now. Now, welcome back. Team Biden continues to have its eyes on the post-debate polls. And as we mentioned, the polling data this afternoon is not good. New numbers from the New York Times and Siena College show Donald Trump leading Biden by nine points among registered voters. But perhaps just as concerning for the campaign, 74 percent of registered voters say President Biden is too old to be an effective president. And that is up five points since the debate. Joining me now is the panel, White House correspondent at USA Today, Francesca Chambers, the former mayor of Ithaca, New York, Savante Myrick, and Republican strategist Jim Dornan. Thank you all so much for joining me here on Meet the Press. Now, I really appreciate it. Uh, Francesca, I want to start with you. It's another day, another round of mm. polls. You know, the Biden campaign tried to pre-butt this uh, New York Times Siena poll uh, by saying, look, it's, uh, you know, it could be an outlier or listen, our internal polls show that the race hasn't really changed that much. Do you think that these polls will make a difference? Will they cause the dam to break, especially as we were hearing earlier, among uh, members of Congress? Well, it's not just one poll, though. It wasn't just the New York Wall Times Street, Siena Wall poll. Journal. Wall Street Journal. And actually, we had a poll at USA Today that we also dropped this week. Previously, it was 37-37 in the race. Now Biden's at 38, and Trump mm. was at 41 percent in our poll. So while that's only a few points and not as far as the New York Times had it, that's edging outside of the margin of error at this point for Joe Biden. Now, in terms of whether, as you said, that would cause the dam to break, what I've been hearing from Biden world, you know, Democrats, White House officials, everyone around him, they think that this is salvageable. They think right. that he can still do this. You see now what a plan emerging here. Go to Wisconsin, go to Pennsylvania, do an interview, do mm -hmm. a press conference. He has NATO next week, an opportunity to be on the world stage as well. Yeah. And then potentially allies of, of the White House and Democrats say, then let's have a conversation. You know, you're on the beat. You see him every day. Does he take enough questions? <laughs> 
think any of us who cover the White House ever right. think that he takes enough enough questions. I think we'd like to see him take questions every day, yeah. all the time. But you know, at the press conferences. It, it is a difficulty when he's not when he is not having them that fr that frequently. Right. Then you do wind up in scenarios where, when he is on the world stage, he sometimes gets questions about things outside right. of those issues and shouted questions, which sometimes can be tough to hear. In all fairness to him, and he's not in the right place to answer them. So, Savante, I want to turn to you. You know, the Biden campaign mm -hmm. is urging their supporters mm -hmm. to ignore the polls and the internal polls, as I mentioned, of a relatively close, close race. At one point, though. Are they asking their supporters to just ignore what they're seeing? I mean, that's what the Trump campaign is saying. Don't believe your lying eyes. Okay. Is that going to be effective? Because according to that New York Times-Siena College poll, 74 percent of voters think that the president is too old to effectively govern. Yeah. Yeah. I, look, I think the president has an opportunity and the campaign has an opportunity here in the next week to demonstrate to the American people that they are up for this race and that he is up for another term as president. But... I do think it's only about a week, right? Mm -hmm. I think we have to answer this question pretty soon. Okay. And, it, and actually, I think it's perfectly normal, in fact, healthy, that a party um, asks questions. I really am proud of the fact to be, rarely <laughs> do I love the disarray that comes with being a Democrat. <laughs> okay. But sometimes you think, okay, well, this is what it's like to not be in a cult, right? We don't believe the same thing on Wednesday as we did on Monday, mm -hmm. no matter what happened on Tuesday. We take in new information, we ask questions, and if the president and his campaign can answer them, we will stand strong behind him as we have. So that's interesting. In your view, chaos, as so many people are predicting here, might not be the worst thing in the world. It might get people excited about exactly. this election, potentially. Democracy is healthy. Right. Asking questions, getting answers is, is healthy. And if you just pretend, as I feel respectfully, and I know you, you agree, um, <laughs> if you pretend like the Republicans have with Trump, that the emperor, who is walking around naked, is actually, in fact, mm -hmm. uh, in a nice bespoke suit. Sure. You do a disservice to the party and the country. But the argument you're making, you know, that the Democrats, you know, might change their minds, but aren't we here because the Democratic Party, you know, wanted to go with President Biden and may have, you know, at least according to the critics, mm -hmm. the argument is that they may have swept some of this under the rug beforehand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, having never made a mistake before, I, I don't know what that feels like. But uh, <laughs> I don't actually think it's a mistake. I think the president has 50 years of public service to his credit. He's accomplished incredible things, including in the last three and a half years. You nominate people both on their potential and on their record. Mm -hmm. And I think it was super fair, not only fair, but well-deserved to nominate President Biden, given everything he's done for the American people. It's also fair to say, hey, is your age catching up to you? Should we talk about this? Show us, you know, work yeah. with us, and we'll see if you're still up for it. So, Jim, uh, Savante mentioned that he has about a week, you know, maybe we to figure this out. He has an interview coming up that he's supposed to do on Friday. There's supposedly a press conference that they've scheduled next week during the NATO summit. How critical are these appearances? And if he messes up on either of those two, is this I, over, I, I think we're seeing the beginning and the end right now. Mm -hmm. I, I honestly believe, I, I agree that it's going to take a week. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Francesca mentioned the Wall Street Journal poll, also had him down eight, I think. Um, and 80% said he shouldn't be running. Uh, I just think it's a matter of time. I think that Kamala is getting the troops together. And mm -hmm. I think the writing is on the wall. I mean, I, I just... I mean, Gravalia doesn't matter outside the Beltway. It matter, he matters inside the House. He's got a powerful voice in there. And it just, I, I just think it was, the debate was devastating. I mean, it was absolutely devastating. And I just think it's a matter of time now. What do you make of somebody that has been relatively, actually almost completely silent this week, which is unlike him? <laughs> Former President Trump mm. has, you know, wh this disciplined campaign, where did it come from? I think everybody's as surprised as you are, <laughs> yeah. to be honest with you. But I also think he's finally listened to his advisors. I mean, that campaign wants to run against Joe Biden. Mm. And I think somebody probably sat him down and said, listen, you open your mouth, you're going to push him over the edge. Let's keep him there so you can beat him. And Francesca, how does the Trump campaign potentially run across, uh, run against Vice President Harris? Um, do, do you think that... You know, that'd be something that they would welcome or they prefer to run against President Biden. Well, right now they're not saying a whole ton about who, who it could potentially be outside of Joe Biden. And by the way, uh, they, they seem to want it to continue to be Joe Biden because right. of the debate performance that Donald Trump had the other night. Uh, I wanted to touch on something else you had said before, though. 
It, I am hearing from Democrats that they also think that Joe Biden mm. should take more questions, that he should get out there okay. and that he should do press conferences, that he should do events without teleprompters to, to show that he, he, he can do this without being on a teleprompter. They believe he should do town halls where he takes questions from voters. That is what I'm hearing from Democratic National Committee members. And, and you know, when you see him in those settings, one on one, that's something his campaign says, but you know, witnessing, he is very good on a one on one setting. Well, and, you know, know when you talk to him mm -hmm. he can be sharp when you know when he interacts with reporters on a you know not outside the white house you know with marine one all loud in the background are they keeping him you know under wraps here under bubble wrap yeah i i do think that joe biden look he's always been a better public servant than a public speaker always since he was 27 mm -hmm. and he's been a better president than he was a debater Right? There are certain things that he has a skill for. He has a humanity, he has a wisdom, mm -hmm. he has a grace, and he has a deep connection with legislators that's helped him pass a ton of legislation. Yep, absolutely. But they're just afraid that these verbal gaffes will turn people off. I think, if anything, we've learned in the last eight years, voters are not so particular about the particularities from Trump to Joe Biden. Right. They just want to see that you're human, that you're capable, that you're here. And I still believe that that's Joe Biden. I still believe that he can do this job, and I look forward to him proving it to us and to the rest of the country. Jim, you know, Democratic governors are meeting with President Biden in a few hours. What do you think, you know, how will that meeting look like? What does President Biden have to say to some of those governors, some of whom are, you know, speaking of Gavin Newsom, are discussed as a potential okay. replacement for him? How critical do you think communicating with those governors will be to whether he can, you know, stay in this race throughout well, the next week. I, I think it's the same as the interview on Friday. He's got to be good. He's got to be on target. And he needs message to be he heard. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, half of those people in that governor's meeting are talked about as being the next <laughs> candidate for well, <laughs> Democratic president. Yeah, a little awkward. Yeah, a little <laughs> all right. We're, we're out of time. Francesca, Jim, Savante, thank you so much for joining us here on the panel. We really appreciate it. Absolute pleasure. And after the break, we're following Barrel's path of destruction as it hits Jamaica. We'll have the latest on the damage already inflicted and where the storm is heading in the coming days. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Right now, Jamaica is facing the most powerful hurricane to strike the island in a generation and the earliest major storm we've ever seen in the Atlantic. As we speak, Hurricane Barrow is bearing down on Jamaica as a Category 4 storm. Forecasters are trying to predict Barrow's path, but authorities in Texas are already preparing for the potential of tropical weather this weekend. This is some of the devastation the storm has already caused in the Caribbean. At least three people were killed in Grenada. The prime minister there calls the damage Armageddon-like. And NBC News correspondent Sam Brock joins me now live from Kingston, Jamaica. Sam, thank you so much for joining us. Tell us, what are you seeing on the ground there right now? Yeah, Gabe, good to be with you. I know Armageddon, obviously, as you said, and other islands in the eastern part of the Caribbean have not experienced that in Jamaica, thankfully. It came real close, though. We are talking about a system here in Barrel, a Category 4 hurricane, 140 mile an hour sustained winds after going overnight through wind shear, through drier air, did not affect the strength of this storm. But it was, Gabe, about 50 or 60 miles south of Kingston, just far enough to avoid the long reach of those hurricane force winds, which are about, you know, 45 miles is basically the threshold for that. So we didn't get anything of that strength or intensity. And yet, I'm standing out here right now, and we have felt periodically, Gabe, from just the outer bands, gusts that have gotten up to 60 or 70 miles an hour. That's not what we got right now. The rain is still coming down. For a while, we were just getting a light rain and basically nothing else. Now we're starting to see the trees swaying from side to side, getting updates from folks who are on the ground from the Office of Emergency Management, saying that they were able to effectively evacuate about 70 people within the last couple of hours to a local shelter. And Gabe, that had been a major issue. You have all these people in low-lying areas with the Prime Minister of Jamaica saying, you guys got to get out of here ahead of the system. And they just said, well, we're not really worried about it. As we get a little bit more of a, of a gust coming through, we're not worried about it because we've survived other hurricanes. Why would this be any different? You know, Luckily for them, this system managed to corner just, just track south and west of where it could have been incredibly dangerous. Uh, we are still, though, worried about electricity right. for many folks. Our hotel here did lose power. Thankfully, we have a generator. Many other areas, though, do not have those sorts of resources. There's older folks who need help, certainly medical assistance, and 
that does become problematic. Yeah. In conversations that I had with people earlier today, what they told me, Gabe, was that their biggest area of concern, connectivity and being able to have electricity. And uh, there's definitely parts of the island right now that are struggling with that. You know, Sam, I was watching some of your reporting yesterday, and you were mentioning that authorities there really hadn't asked for any evacuation, any mandatory evacuations. You said that several dozen were evacuated uh, today. But talk to me about that. Did authorities wait too long here to issue any evacuation orders? Yeah, so I think you're asking about evacuations, obviously, and I'm sorry so the connection is going a little bit in and out. With respect to mandatory or underlying evacuations that were required, there wasn't an order. We know that it's confirmed. It was not an order last night. Um, according to the prime minister, he gives the director general the authority to then give local officials the ability to get people out of low-lying areas. But then he basically came out last night and said, well, we did issue this evacuation, and right now not everyone is abiding by it. I urge you to do so. Super unclear game whether or not that was actually required or not. Hopefully everyone is safe where they need to be right now as this continues to pick up. Sam Brock, live for us in Jamaica. Sam, thank you so much to you and to your crew. Stay safe. Thank you. NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens has been tracking Barrel, and he joins me now. Bill, what's the latest track here? Yeah, we're going to get the new update from the Hurricane Center in the next 15, 20 minutes. I'm going to explain first what's happening in Jamaica because we just saw where Sam is located. He's in Kingston right here. So do not judge what you're seeing in the pictures uh, and saying, OK, nothing happened in Jamaica. The eastern half of the island was much further away than the center over the last six hours. Notice that this line is inching northwards as it goes. Jamaica is 140 miles from east to west. It's pretty much a straight line. So as the storm is all of a sudden heading northwards, it's getting much closer closer to the coast and now that northern eye has taken a little bit of a jog and it is smack all on the south coast of Jamaica. So that's 60 miles from where Sam is located. That's why he's not blowing around like crazy, but they are getting a rough blow of it. I guarantee we're going to have significant wind damage problems uh, from the southern point here. This is Point Rocks and then all the way back out here to Black River. This is the area that's going to get you know, if there's going to be destruction done. That's happening right now as we speak and you can see this red line is supposed to be the forecast and if I put my finger on it, that's the center. So it's jogged a little bit north of where the hurricane center, the last forecast was. This red shows you where the hurricane force winds are. Notice just some strong tropical storm gusts around Kingston, but that hurricane sustained winds where the damage is being done is on that south coast. It mm -hmm. also may clip Montego Bay, but hopefully it'll stay to the south. Next stop tonight, the Cayman Islands, and then we're going to take this towards the Yucatan as we go throughout tomorrow night. The storm is still moving very quickly. It'll weaken, so 140, and the next update will probably be like 135 or 130, and then tomorrow we think it will go down to a category two and eventually hopefully about a category one as it makes that next landfall in just south of Tulum. And of course, all our friends in the Gulf and Texas and northern Mexico want to know where the storm's going to finally end up. It may gain a little bit of strength over the weekend if it's organized enough and then it will be heading somewhere Brownsville to Tampico. That's kind of the target area where right now, you know, we're hinting more to the south, not a direct impact in Texas, Gabe. And Bill, I know you're following a lot in the weather department. Just uh, give us an update on the latest on the the dangerous heat that's also hitting the U.S.? Yeah, we've been talking about heat for the last, like, six weeks. And obviously, you, you talk about something endlessly and it kind of, you know, just, you know, like, okay, it's another heat wave. It's the middle of summer. But this could set all-time records. And that doesn't happen very often for a few spots. So, yes, 112 million people, hot, humid here in the south. The west is a dry heat, but it is brutally hot. So, Redding in, could break their all-time record high on Sunday. And then Las Vegas has a chance of breaking their all-time record high as we go throughout the end of the weekend, either Sunday or Monday. So, for today, <laughs> We're baking Fresno, Sacramento, hottest day you've seen in roughly two, three years. And then look what happens as we go towards the weekend. Palm Springs, around 120 degrees, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sacramento, 110 to 110. And uh, it's just going to keep going. It doesn't look like this heat wave is going to end until early next week. And that forecast for Vegas, Gabe, I don't know if you've ever been on the Strip. The hottest it's ever been is 117. The forecast calls for 118 degrees. That wow. Is you know, somebody, Bill, yeah. I've yeah. actually reported on previous heat waves out west. Was in Vegas for that. It wasn't 118, though. I mean, 121 <laughs> in Palm Springs. Oh, that is that is just devastating. Bill yeah, Karens, it, thank you it, so much. Yep, no problem, buddy. Thank you. All right. Next, the reproductive rights fight in Arizona gets closer to making it on the November ballot. We are live in Phoenix with the latest. You're watching Meet the Press now. Stay with us. Welcome back. One of the most hotly contested issues 
will now likely be on the ballot this November in one of the most hotly contested states. Supporters of a proposed amendment to enshrine abortion access in Arizona's constitution say they collected enough signatures to put that amendment on the ballot. The group leading the effort says they collected more than 823,000 signatures of registered voters, more than twice the number needed to move forward with the process. And today's announcement comes nearly three months after Arizona's Supreme Court reinstated a near total ban on abortion from 1864 and more than two months after Democratic uh, Governor Katie Hobbs signed a bill repealing that ban after it passed through the Republican-controlled state legislature. So NBC News political campaign embed Alex Tabbitt was there when those signatures were delivered to Arizona Secretary of State, and he joins me now live from Phoenix. Alex, it's so good to have you here. How many signatures were organizers hoping to get? Gabe, organizers were hoping to get about 800,000 signatures. The Arizona Secretary of State requires about 383,000 signatures uh, be gathered in order for an initiative to appear before voters in November. They more than doubled that with 800 and about 23,000 signatures. And to put that number into context, Gabe, that is far and away the record for the most signatures ever gathered for any ballot initiative in Arizona state history. The previous record was about half a million signatures, so it really was a historic haul. Now the Arizona that Secretary of State is going to go through a signature verification process. They're going to make sure that each and every signature is valid, that each person who signed actually is registered to vote in the state of Arizona. But that's just the first hurdle in this ballot initiative's journey onto making it onto the ballot. I talked to Secretary of State Andrew, Adrian Fontes earlier today about what comes next. Take a listen. Well, number of signatures isn't the only threshold. I mean, uh, I, I would imagine that somebody's going to be litigating the actual nature of the initiative in the first place through the courts. Uh, so that there's, there's still those kinds of battles that are going to be taking place. This is just the start uh, for the folks who've been collecting signatures. Uh, this is an important milestone. But as far as the formal process is concerned, this is day one. And I've talked to opponents of abortion rights. They tell me they have lawyers on retainer ready to scrutinize this proposed constitutional amendment. The current law here in Arizona allows abortion up until 15 weeks of pregnancy. The proposed constitutional amendment would move that barrier up until around fetal viability, around 24 weeks of pregnancy, and vastly expand the scope for exceptions. One of those exceptions is in the event that a mother's physical or mental health is in danger. Mm -hmm. And opponents of abortion rights are saying that mental health language is too broad and is too susceptible to abuse. That seems to be the legal framework that they're going to choose in, in hopes to uh, challenge this abortion mm -hmm. ballot initiative from b appearing before voters in November. Gabe? And Alex, so Arizona's um, uh, legislature already repealed that state's near total ban. Is there concern that this issue now would have less urgency, though, among Arizona voters? There's no doubt that the Arizona Supreme Court upholding the 1864 near total ban on abortion for about a month here in Arizona really catalyzed this signature movement. Uh, organizers say that they were getting signatures at a clip in that month before that 1864 ban was repealed. Uh, that was unprecedented, but they're confident that this is still going to pass in November in the same way it passed in Kansas and the same way it passed in Ohio, more Republican states. Gabe? Alex Tabbitt, thank you so much. Live for us in Phoenix. We appreciate it. And next, the Supreme Court ruling you may have missed amid the deluge of historic decisions. It could impact hundreds of thousands of Americans without a home. You're watching Meet the Press now. Stay with us. Welcome back. It was a historic and controversial term for the Supreme Court with rulings tied to presidential immunity, abortion access, January 6 defendants, and more. But perhaps loss in the tidal wave of headlines was a major ruling handed down by the high court on the issue of homelessness. In a case brought by the city of Grants Pass, Oregon, the court cleared the way for cities to enforce bans on homeless individuals sleeping outside in public places. In a 6-3 decision along ideological lines, the justices found that such a ban did not violate the Eighth Amendment that prohibits cruel and unusual punishment. Writing for the majority, 
Justice Neil Gorsuch acknowledged that the issue of homelessness is a complex one, but that the Eighth Amendment does not allow federal judges to dictate the nation's homelessness policy. Meanwhile, in her dissent, Justice Sonia Sotomayor said sleep is a biological necessity, not a crime. Writing, quote, the majority focuses almost exclusively on the needs of local governments and leaves the most vulnerable in our society with an impossible choice. Either stay awake or be arrested. And joining me now is Eric Parr, Senior Policy Director at the National Homelessness Law Center. Excuse me. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, um, Eric. Um, what does this ruling mean for local officials that are trying to come up with policies to address this in their cities? Uh, thanks so much for having me today. Um, while the Supreme Court's decision on grants passed is significant, the court on its own was never going to solve homelessness, whichever way it decided on the issue. Solving homelessness requires the political will to focus on and fund uh, housing and other proven solutions to homelessness. The problem is that using law enforcement to temporarily move homeless people out of public view under the threat of arrest or ticketing is politically expedient because the cost can be hidden, but because it doesn't address the root causes of homelessness, um, it's really an, actually an expensive way that just makes the problem worse. The root cause of homelessness remains the lack of affordable housing, and we need comprehensive and sustained action from all levels of government, regardless of the court's decision. And Eric, there's been mixed reaction to this ruling, including California, which has the largest unhoused population. Governor Gavin Newsom welcomed the decision. He says it would remove legal ambiguity that have tied the hands of local officials. But Los Angeles Mayor Karen Bass called it a pretext for cities to arrest their way out of this problem. So what do you make of that divide over this issue, even, even among lawmakers in the same party? Um, we really appreciate Mayor Bass stepping up and calling out the lie that Governor Newsom and other elected officials are, are perpetrating saying that uh, this decision ties, somehow tied the hands of communities. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. Having a baseline that says that Americans who just can't afford to pay their rent can't be punished for trying to survive in public spaces when there is no uh, legal, safe, alternative place for them to do so, it actually opens up the political conversation to the solutions that we know are most effective, which are housing and services. Um, and unfortunately, what we see without the court's protection, with the protection that the court just removed last week, is that communities will be forced into a smaller political space where they feel compelled to use these short-term, short-sighted approaches like ticketing, arresting, finding people that has never solved homelessness. If it solved homelessness, we'd have solved homelessness a long time ago. Um, but it's never worked. It's really costly, and it takes away resources from the things that actually do work, which are housing and services. Does this essentially criminalize homelessness? Um, not on its own. The court is very careful to say that just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. Um, and so uh, it enables, it will pave the way for communities uh, to put in place these laws uh, criminalizing homelessness. Um, but uh, the court was also very careful to say that the um, homeless people are not without constitutional protections and that we can, um, we as the, at the National Homelessness Law Center will continue uh, to pursue those legal options and we are gonna pursue uh, policy options to make sure that homeless people uh, or that people yeah. don't become homeless in the first place. Uh, you've mentioned housing uh, several times as, you know, that that might be one of the viable solutions here. But th if that is a solution, that could take years. So what should cities do in the meantime? Uh, well, the first thing they should do is not make the problem worse. And devoting resources to criminal justice approaches um, hasn't worked. And it just puts further uh, fines, fees, and the way of people saving up for their first month's rent and security deposits. An arrest record can be a hindrance to getting or maintaining employment. So don't make the problem worse is problem number is, uh, you know, solution number one. And then um, cities don't have all the resources they need. We do need a dramatic new investment from the federal level into universal rental assistance and uh, the National Housing Trust Fund, uh, other ways of preventing homelessness. Um, but at the local level, cities um, can uh, use vacant properties. Uh, there was a lot of work during the pandemic, moving people into hotels and motels. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot that can be done constructively at the local level uh, to get people off the streets, out of harm's way, yeah. and then um, help them into permanent housing as it comes online. Eric Tars, thank you so much for joining us here to talk about this important issue.
And uh, before we so go, a programming note. Tune in, tune in tomorrow night, July 4th, for an NBC News Now special, Party Animals, Politics, Biggest Show. Chuck Todd opens the NBC News Archives vault for a look at the history of political conventions. That's tomorrow at 10.30 p.m. Eastern Time right here on NBC News Now. And we're back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. I'm Gabe Gutierrez. NBC News Now coverage continues with Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.